Hi, welcome to um, Mulligan Stew and the Mulligan Stew podcast. I'm Terry David Mulligan. That's why they call it that. Kevin Hearn, a musician, artist, uh, family person, um, friend. Uh, I found you where? Where have I found you? You're underneath the stairs. Yeah. <laughs> in my, my condo loft in Toronto, Ontario. Do you have a country place that you, you get out of town to? I do, up in Muskoka. Do you write there, record there? Do you, uh, what do you do? Uh, that's where I go to write. And I do, I built a little recording cabin up there. And I spent a lot of time up there during the pandemic, uh, just isolating and, and playing piano. Okay. Now, you know, we're going to be talking about uh, here and then. Oh, there and then. There and then. Uh, piano, piano improvisations. <laughs> you could easily easily have done it in Muskoka you could have you could have done you could have played piano until the cows came home uh but no no you had to you had to put an adventure to it you had to yes <laughs> quite an adventure and we'll tell that story in just a moment uh I will uh for those of you watching on uh YouTube and video those are packing crates in the back of my uh, studio here. We're mid move. Um, March two, we pull the plugs, and 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 pray that we get it all right when we move it. Have you ever moved a studio? And and, and yeah, have you been responsible for the pluggings? No, I can't do that. <laughs> no, 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 you have to have you have to have someone who saves your butt every time. It just happens. Um, let's start with uh, there and then because. It's right in front of us. It's just been released. Uh, piano improvis improvisations. In the grand scheme of things, what did you hope to accomplish with this a recording and release? As you well know, there's there's not many runaway bestsellers for piano improvisations. And so <laughs> um, you do it for personal reasons. What else? Uh, I felt um, I recorded it at the end of 2020. Yep. And I, I felt I would have liked to express something creatively after that kind of crazy year, which we all went through in our own different way and had to navigate in our own personal way. Sure. But I found it difficult to write during that time. I found it difficult to express what I was feeling. And when the opportunity in, in lyrics, um, and so when the opportunity came up to do this, I thought, wow, well, this is a really cool way of just a direct plug in into how I'm feeling at the end of this year and being in isolation and not being able to hug my daughter because she she lives in a home and, you know, just all the things, the band, you know, we finished a record, but we weren't able to play shows and I thought, what an interesting experiment. Just go in, play a piano, and, and let it out and see what happens. And at the very worst, you know, I don't put anything out. But it didn't quite roll out like that. I mean, yet you could have gone into any studio and, and improvised. People would have left you alone. You could have done solo piano. But you decided, uh, through Hooker by Crook, to record in th three different locations, four different locations. At uh, three different locations, yeah. Over three days. Yeah. And and let me get this right, that you, who chose the locations? Who chose the time? How did you meet? And who was a, your partner? You needed someone to record all of this. Yes. Uh, okay, can I tell you the, I'll try to make it as short as possible, but it is an interesting story. In 2019, I produced and MD'd a, uh, a restaging of, the Secret Path Show, which was the brilliant record that Gore Downey made. And uh, we did it at Roy Thompson Hall and we had a after show um, get together. And this man approached me and we connected because he told me he was a cancer, a recent cancer survivor. Yep. And his name was Mark. And so we talked about that for about 40 minutes and eventually got to well what do you do mark and he goes oh i produce records and i mm -hmm. said oh <laughs> have you produced you know any artist i might know 
he said, well, I've done records with uh, Bob Dylan, Neil Young, Tom Waits. <laughs> like, oh, okay. I think I've heard a couple of those people. And uh, it was Mark Howard. Um, and so at that time, the Bare Naked Ladies were just getting ready to record some new songs. And, and Mark came on board to record us. And we were living all together. Um, and I would come upstairs in the morning and just warm up on the piano. And Mark would say, well, what is that? And I say, I don't know, I'm just making it up the next morning. Okay, well, what is that? <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just warming up, Mark, just noodling about like I do. And um, he said, we should make a record like that. Oh, there you go. Yeah, and he'd, he'd made records with a, a pianist named Harold Budd and made records with Brian Eno and Roger Eno so he knew that world of ambient music. And so it was, yeah. Ambient music, explain to the audience and, and myself. I, see the phrase, I say the phrase, I hear the phrase, but what, does that, what are the parameters of ambient music? I think it's sort of an abstract uh, expression, usually instrumental music. Brian Eno said that, um, Brian Eno is kind of considered the, the godfather of ambient music. And he says that ambient music should be interesting, but also completely ignorable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you can actively listen and enjoy it that way, or you can put it on and it can just become part of the atmosphere that you're in and um, you can enjoy it that way as well. All right, so let's give folks an, ex an example because it's just two guys talking and nobody's playing piano. Um, tell me about the power ballad, <laughs> Among the Stars. Among the Stars. Yeah, that's sort of a waltz that came out of an improv. And it's just, uh, that, that's one of the songs that has the most structure on the record. Yeah. But I, I was thinking, um, you know, I, I paid tribute to Gord Downey and, and sort of put the title Among the Stars because that was the indigenous name he was given shortly before he passed away, A Man Who Walks Among the Stars. So it's a tribute to him. Okay. Well, actually, the whole album is, we'll come right down to it, I think. In it, There's in a lot, way, yeah. In its own way. Um, all right, here it is, Among the Stars, Kevin Hearn, There and Then. I may even get the title right. <laughs> he's, he's I'm Hearn. still having trouble with it, so don't worry about it. <laughs> he's Kevin Hearn. I'm Terry David Mulligan. We're uh, examining his uh, latest uh, release, There and Then, Piano Improvisations. Uh, came out February the 11th, uh, charging up the uh, Spotify charts uh, with plays. Because it's just going to get played. Uh, listen, here's the thing. People aren't going to play just one track. They're going to let this music and this album have the room because one leads to another, leads to another, leads to another. You might be totally blissed out by the time you're done, or perhaps um, you've thrashed about in bed, whatever. You, uh, it's, it has, <laughs> there's no parameters to it. It's fantastic. Oh. Um, what you thought it was going to be like as an experiment and what it was actually like were they slightly different? Um, no, you know, the only difference is what I, what I hoped to do initially when Mark called me and said, let's actually do this. I, I had the idea that it would be fun to find haunted spaces that have hotels in them, okay. you know, which I've run across places like that in my travels. And I, I always found it inspiring to play in a room that has a vibe or an energy or spirits in it, you know? Um, I went to this ghost town in Arizona once called Jerome yeah. and- Oh, I, I know, know that, it's up on the hill. Oh yeah, yeah. I've been yeah. there. That's have where, you? that's where, what's his face from, um, from one Tool. of the- Tool. That's yeah. where he has his winery. Yeah. Yeah. And they've, they've turned the old hospital into a hotel. Yeah. So yeah. I said, do you have a room? And it, the room was the whole top floor because there was no one there. <laughs> you know what that town reminded me of? 
the set right. in the Popeye film. Like they have the pipes hanging down, the thing, but like an Altman set or something. It was, I just love that place. Yeah. Uh, and he was our, our, our host. We were there to drink his wines. That's cool. Did you like his wine? I loved his wines. Yeah. <laughs> his insanely good wines. Oh, yeah. yeah, when I was there, I learned that he lived there and owned the winery. And I thought, that's pretty cool. That's, you know. Yeah. Um, and so in my room, there was an old piano. Yeah. And I just, that was the first time I was like, wow, the room really makes a difference. And the piano makes a difference. And so I suggested to Mark, let's find places like that, that have um, some energy and an old piano. And we'll yeah. go and record. Because Mark's thing is he doesn't go into recording studios. He always likes to set up in a place, you know, like he did Willie, um, Willie Nelson's record Teatro was recorded oh, in an with, old with, um, movie theater. Yeah. Yeah. So I love that album. Love that album. It's a great album. So um, we couldn't travel around as much as we would have liked to. So he sourced out three places in Quebec that we could drive to and drive back no okay. restaurants were open at the time. It was very much like go in, do this and get out kind of thing. Uh, by the way, uh, th that winery in Jerome, that's Apache territory. There's spirits. Oh. There. There's no two ways about it. There's a lot of spirit there. You can feel it. Um, so when did you know, uh, uh, I mean, you can't go back and re or did you go back and re-record or is it one time, this is it, this is our day, we're gonna record walk away kind of thing? Yeah, that's why it's called there and then, because what you're hearing is what happened. There's no overdubs, there's no edits. Um, there, are, there are pieces that we didn't include because they you know, either weren't that interesting or they went off of a cliff, so to speak. <laughs> so <laughs> we sort of harvested the best that what we felt was the best. Uh, go, play, leave, basically. Yes. And, and no talking really. Like I told Mark, I don't want to talk about bands or sports or anything. I, I just tell me where it is. I'm going to walk there. I'm going to go inside, sit down and play for three hours and then leave. Why are you, why are you causing such a problem? Why are you doing it? <laughs> I'm a diva. <laughs> 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 oh my god um kevin hearn is the name of that diva um now you know if you were still making music with corky and the juice pigs this would be a skit <laughs> there'd be something in there yeah there'd be something in there um yeah. so did you do you, do you were you a fan of Corky and the Juice oh, Pigs? Oh, oh, totally, totally from day one. I okay. love them. I love that humor, that absurdist humor. I loved how much they set up themselves and everyone in the audience. It was wonderful. Yeah, I saw a fellow who looked exactly like Phil Nickel riding his bike uh, a few months ago, and I was just looking at him, going, "That looks exactly like Phil Nickel." And he saw me looking at him, and he looked at me and said. Are you enjoying my magic? <laughs> <laughs> and so I had to call Phil right away and tell him, like, you just spoke to me through this person here in Toronto. <laughs> I can remember the last time I saw them was uh, in, they were playing at some sort of a live stage in front of the Hudson Bay Company, a place where music had never been made before. And mm -hmm. People were walking half a block around them because they had no idea what was going on on that stage. I love those guys. Anyway, um, uh, the I wanted to ask you about um, Lou, of course, uh, because I, I thought it was about Lou Reed, who you led a band for and with for many years, uh, 27, 2007 to 2013. Um, but but the uh, I, I well first of all there's no lyrics except for the ooze yeah did the ooze become Lou? Uh, yeah, I decided when I was trying to make titles for the record. Oh, it sounds kind of like Lou. Well, let's put, play pay tribute to Lou, and this one's for him. <clears throat> 
So do you, when, when you play, uh, do you still see Lou? Can you hear Lou? Can you feel him? He's always around. I miss him so much, Terry David. And uh, I always think, what would Lou think of this? Or what would he say, you know? The, uh, tell me the, the Lou Reed that we knew publicly and the, and the Lou that you knew privately, vastly different? Um, I would say so. I think, you know, people seem to dwell on this... Um, this image of Lou is very cantankerous and nasty. Mm -hmm. And he could, yeah. he could be that way, but he was also a very loyal and loving friend and husband. And he was one of the nicest caring guys I ever met and probably the funniest guy I ever met. Wow, oh, man. Just saying a lot, being the cousin of Harland Williams. <laughs> yes. uh, 13 movements, 53 minutes. A tight little package. Uh, what moments particularly speak to you? Uh, well, no, that's not true. Uh, other than Among the Stars, was there another moment that spoke to Gord and Secret Path and, and his life? Uh, well, I did ask his daughter Willow to do the artwork. Yes. And um, she listened to the record while painting it. <clears throat> and that's it there. But... And where's the original art now? Um, that's uh, highly classified information. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. I have it. Um, I'm getting it framed. Yeah. Okay. And Mike Downey, uh, Gord's brother, directed the video, the video. for Yeah, I love the yeah, video. For Lou. We, you know, years ago... On my site. Yeah, years ago, I played on Gord's first solo record called um, Coke Machine Glow. And... Uh, a song called Chancellor, which has always been one of my favorite things I've ever done. And Mike directed the video for Chancellor, and I always loved it. It's in black and white and kind of haunting. And um, so I, I thought that'd be a cool thing to try and do something, collaborate with Mike. Uh, rooms. Uh, I mean, you are working in three different rooms. Are you speaking to the rooms? Is it or is it just a title you needed, something that marketing people were after? <laughs> Actually, Mark titled that one. And uh, I think he called it uh, Shrooms. <laughs> 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 I said, well, I can't put a, a record a song. Well, I could, but I, I changed it to Rooms because, as you said, it made more sense with, you know, being in the in the three different rooms. Um. So really, I mean, normally when, when we do interviews like this, as you well know, Kev, we, we have a lyric sheet in front of us. And you say, why did you, are you actually, what are you trying to say with this song? Right? I'm trying to read between the notes and the characters. <laughs> I can't read your fingers and I can't see you. play. And, and so I guess these tunes are going to be what we think they are, what they, what re reflection we have within ourselves, which is very exactly. The titles don't matter. They're just a point of reference. Um, it's just an abstract, you know, expression. And hopefully, yeah, it brings different images or feelings to everybody. Mm -hmm. I hope it takes people to a, a relaxed, peaceful, dreamlike place and that they could just drift off to it if they want. So but, no boogie, no woogie, <laughs> no radiating the 88s. Nothing like that. None it's of that. What are you becoming a beat poet now? <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> However, there is one very specific title that I got to ask you about. Okay. Garth Institute. The Garth Institute. Yeah. Um, Garth Hudson from the band, you know, he's a friend of mine and uh, a hero. And I'd been doing some work with him over the years, and him and his he and his wife Maud were talking about this school they wanted to open, mm -hmm. uh, a music school called the Garth Institute. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> Garth would just wander around from classroom to classroom and give sort of impromptu seminars about different topics of music. Of course, the school never um, happened. But 
I thought the idea of the Garth Institute was kind of a nice daydream. And so I think it could live on in this in this way. And it has nothing to do with Garth Brooks. Uh, I'm sorry, no. No. <laughs> it can if you want, as I said, you know, whatever you want to think about. It would have been nice if you could have included something for Richard Manuel. Maybe like a something to sit on a bench. One Ron Sexsmith always talks about he visits Richard's bench. Is that right? Yeah. Wow. Well, well, those two guys. Cool. Those two guys just they're the shit for me. They are the they are the guys. Who so Garth and and Richard? Yeah, and 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 Richard Bell. I mean, Richard Bell. the guys that held down that piano in that band specifically. Everybody else is flashy up front, and all guitars and things, and leave on all that stuff. For me, it was the piano guys on piano, which is why you are one of my favorite people on the face of the planet. Wow. Yeah. Wow, that's really nice. Thank you. Well, I mean, there's it's more than just being an artist. It's the human being that you are. Um, uh, three hours and three days, uh, three hours and three days, uh, <clears throat> three spaces, three pianos. Um, how did it all work out? You know, I've never done a record like this and it, I listened to it and I can't even believe it, it you know, cause it just, it took that as much time as it takes you to listen to it. That's how long it took to make. Could you understand how people might uh, receive this music? I said two, two part question. Could you, under, I mean, going in, would you think, did you get a sense of, of how they might reflect on it or, or use it in their lives? And secondly, with the turmoil that's going on in our world, inside and outside our homes, what value can be had in this music? I mean, you can't plan for this. This just is, this is, this is the fabric upon which it's playing. What do you think? Um, I think it's universal in that I, uh, I was feeling a lot of the feelings that we all were feeling through the pandemic. And I was trying to channel that, but I was trying to uh, take it to a peaceful, beautiful place. And I think by design, it's, it's meant to be a bomb for the soul in this um, time that we find ourselves in. <laughs> yeah. Uh, can't wait for the tour. Oh yeah, <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's gonna be low cost. <laughs> Uh, and what's the first single? Well, I don't know if there's a single. You know? <laughs> I made a video for Lou, and people seem to really like that one. So, all right, that's the first single. And the remixes to follow? Remixes? No. no. We did. I did a couple pieces where I did spoken word on top, but I, I felt it took it took you out of the spell. But I might release those at some point. Okay, let me know if you need a narrator. Um, so uh, can we move on, Kev, just for a second? Of course. Uh, your other project, the Bare Naked Ladies. Um, yes. Where are we at? What's 2022 look like? For you, you know, we're just getting ready to go over to the UK for a tour that we've postponed for uh, two years in a row. Yeah. We have a show at the Royal Albert Hall on nice. Yeah, January, uh, sorry, yeah, March 28th. So that's exciting. There's a piano at the Royal Albert, you know that. Yeah, are you suggesting I do some oh, more I mean, recording? If you can get there before <laughs> sound check. <laughs> wow. Oh man. Um and and talk about and, spirits in places, yeah. eh? <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. But then the rest of the year, is it one big tour? Do you just keep going? Uh we have a summer tour planned in the US and brings us to Canada, I think. I think we're gonna try to get out west for a few Canadian shows. You know, we're, we're hoping to get back to, to working and, and playing for our fans again. No kidding. Yeah, it's been weird that way. How do you think the business is going to be changed by all of this? I, I hope that there is a, and I'm already feeling it at shows, there's a, a deeper appreciation for the present moment and for what, what's happening and what the, for what we're all experiencing. And I think that bodes well for... Uh, live music. Uh, still, uh, Secret Path Band still going? Um, 
we get together when when it makes sense. Sure. I just did a a few shows with Josh Finlinson. Um, nice. who's, yeah, who is in the Secret Path band, but also the Sky Diggers, oh. and we. We also have a new band member, Chief Stacy Laform, uh, who does spoken word uh, poetry that he writes over our music. So yeah. that's been a that's been a cool collaboration as well. By the way, in those three hours and those three rooms and those three pianos and the, I'm, I'm remind me remind, remind me to ask you about the the echo, the acoustics. Um, did any spirits visit you? Did you feel any presence? Yeah, I, 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 I thought would, a lot I mean, of- I know you would be open to it, that's for certain. Yeah, I, I, I hope so. You know, I didn't get out a Ouija board or anything, but uh, <laughs> there were people on my mind that were with me. And, uh, you know, I grew up in a church choir singing at St. Michael's Cathedral down here in Toronto. So the first location was in a cathedral. So that, that brought, Okay. back some memories and i channeled that uh, mark was also uh playing some delays and effects in tandem with the performances and i was sort of bouncing off that as well you know sometimes a delay he would put in would sort of indicate a tempo and i would lock into that but because we we're in a big church you know i could couldn't play a lot of dense notes i had to just play one note wait a little make leave the space and so it's quite slow and mellow. <laughs> That's what I wanted to uh, kind of leave you with. And that is that uh, it was Miles Davis who taught me about the space between the notes. He could let, he could let a space hang for seven, eight, ten seconds and wait for the space to play itself and then jump in. Uh, you had echo going for you. So you could be playing with yourself, mm -hmm. opposite yourself, in harmony with whatever you were what was that, that that fraction that little moment between note played note heard what was that like it was an interesting balancing act because i i had to think a little but i also was aiming not to think as much as possible and just play wow yeah when you we, know you, did you ever you, see the documentary with ken burns about jazz yes of course and, yeah, of there's a, a great interview with Duke Ellington where the interviewer asks him, how do you write your songs? And he says, that's not writing, that's dreaming. <laughs> and he then plays this mind-blowing little thing on the piano and goes, that's dreaming. And that's what I was aiming for, that kind of uh, approach. That's actually my homework book. It's, it normally would be right behind me on that on a shelf uh -huh. there. The jazz book. I just... It went by too fast. I wanted to go by and and and, and start again and really read the stuff. And uh, I'm not. I didn't get to the Duke Ellington yet. I was still in uh, New Orleans with Bix and Louie and those those cats. That was a that was a tough town. That was a tough town. And um, but to be a musician, you, know, you were a target. So um, I, I I'm sorry. I'm getting. I I digress from. Oh, it's okay. I love it. It's it was it's it's a fantastic read and Duke Ellington, the professor, you know, elegant yeah. man. Hugo. That's why I love going to cities like New Orleans and where there's that that rich musical history and you can really feel it. I tell you, there may be a second life for this music, Kevin. Somebody's currently making a film somewhere or is about to make a film somewhere, and they're going to be drawn into this music. You watch. Uh, maybe not the whole it. album, maybe a, a track or two. Ghostbuster <laughs> 6. <laughs> <laughs> the Marvel Universe. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's it. Okay, um, any other projects? You know, anything we should know about? Um, you know, I'm working on a, a record of 80s covers with Hugh Marsh. That's being co it's quite cool. His album? No, it's a collaboration. Okay. Yeah, but we've got members of the Sun Ra Orchestra on it and uh, Brian Ritchie from the Violent Femmes and Carol Pope sings a little on it. It's going to be pretty cool. Like Duran Duran? What are you two what are you covering? You know, I wanted to do Duran Duran, the chauffeur, but Hugh said no. <laughs> so 
you know, he was quite picky. We, we are doing some OMD. We got some Sun Ra, some Bob Marley, some Bob Dylan, um, Billy Idol, you know, a, quite a, a broad spectrum. All right, I'm, I made these notes. I want to make sure I, I answer. Oh, by the way, I had intended to ask you at the very top. The very first question was, are you safe? Are you well? Are you okay? Yes, I'm good. Thank you. And the two years you've been okay? Yeah, it's been challenging, just like everyone else, I'm sure, feels that way. But uh, I've been lucky and I'm doing okay. All right, then. Uh, thank you for your time. You thank you. Pretty cool that we get to do this. Yeah, it's we're lucky. And I always love talking to you, Terry David. So thank you. Um, just let me know what the next project is and I'll be there. Um, and thank you for the video. It's very cool. Video, the, the visual brings all of the music to life. You should actually be thinking about a couple of more videos as well. And maybe the second single, you know. Let me know what let me know what you which one. <laughs> Uh, me, uh, uh, it's either rooms or among the stars. Okay. Yeah. Noted. Uh, thank you for your time. And uh, I'll see you down the road whenever that might be. Look forward to it.